Hi, I'm Whitney Espick, the CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I hope you enjoy this digital production created for alumni and friends like you. Welcome, MIT alumni and friends. We're delighted you could join us this evening for a discussion of the film, From Controversy to Cure, Inside the Cambridge Biotech Boom. I'm Susan Hockfield, MIT President Emerita, Professor of Neuroscience and member of the Koch Institute for Integrative Cancer Research. And I'm gonna serve as moderator for what I anticipate will be a terrifically interesting discussion. Joining me this evening is a truly illustrious lineup. It's a who's who of MIT's change makers in biotech, who also served as a cast of characters in the film. We have Nubar Afayan, who is the founder and CEO of Flagship Pioneering and a PhD alum from 1987. David Baltimore, President Emeritus, Robert Andrews Milliken Professor of Biology at California Institute of Technology, formerly a professor at MIT. Sangeeta Bhatia, John and Dorothy Wilson Professor, Health Science and Technology Program and an MIT PhD alum from 1997. Nancy Hopkins, Professor Emerita, Department of Biology, Joe McMaster, the film's producer and director, and last but not least, Professor Philip Sharp. He's an institute professor and professor of biology and an honorary member of the MIT Alumni Association. Now, we hope that many of you have already had a chance to view the film ahead of our discussion tonight. And if you haven't, you'll find a link to it, to see it for free on our event page. We also encourage you to be in touch if you're interested in arranging a special, special screening of the film for your own network, your university, your company, or at a local theater. We think the film will be of interest to many people. So I'm going to get the discussion started this evening with some opening questions, but we really want to hear from you in the audience. So please use the Q&A box below the live stream to post questions for our panelists and we'll try to get to as many as we can in the time we have this evening. Now, I have to let you know that we are recording this discussion and alumni staff will post an archive of it on the MIT Alumni Association channel on YouTube. So with those preliminaries done, let's get started. So I wanna start with Joe McMaster, who had a significant role in actually making the film and um, I want Joe to tell us a little bit about how and why this film got made. <clears throat> uh, thanks, Susan. Um, and, and first, I'd just like to thank you and all the panelists for taking part in this event and, uh, and in the film. Everyone's given a lot of their time to the project. Um, I, I came to MIT um, from PBS in 2014 and was uh, just found that you know you can't spend five minutes in Kendall Square without being struck by two um, two very obvious things: the physical transformation taking place um, there right before your eyes, and as Eric Lander says in the film, that Kendall Square is home to the greatest concentration of life scientists in the known universe. So it's pretty clear that there's something very unusual going on here. And I was curious about what's the story behind this? Um, you know, how did this become the so-called biotechnology capital of the world? And what was MIT's role in all of this? Um, I work at MIT Video Productions where we make videos for MIT. Uh, and the head of our department, Larry Gallagher, shared this curiosity. And we began talking about making a documentary to explore the subject. And one of the first people we talked to was Phil Sharp. And he, of course, has what you might call a passing interest in this subject. And um, thanks to generous support of the Sharp Charitable Trust and Neil and Jane Papalardo, we dug into the story of how this came to be, which is fascinating because it's really due to the messy convergence of dozens of unplanned and even unrelated factors. Um, some of them very surprising and colorful. So I began interviewing some of the people who are key to this story, about 35 in all in the film, so we could tell the story in the voices of those um, who know it best, including everyone on this panel. But there's so much that we couldn't include in the film because it's just an enormous, enormous topic. Um, 
so I'm looking forward to this evening because uh, I'd like to, uh, you know, we've got we've got this incredible group of people here who can um, can really fill in a lot of the blanks. Um, so um, thank you very much. Well, thanks, Joe. Uh, the history of biotech in Kendall is truly one of the great stories of 20th century biology, biomedicine, biopharma. Now, David and Phil on our, among our panelists participated in the very early days of Kendall. And I really want them to talk to us about why did this area become the world's epicenter of biotech innovation and how? I mean, what were the key factors and events that led to the creation really from nothing to a world leading biotech cluster. And um, if you might help us understand how much of it was actually planned and how much of it would you characterize as happenstance? David, Phil? Well, David, why don't you uh, uh, speak first? All right. I I came to MIT in 1960. And I came as a graduate student. I didn't last very long, but that's beside the point. <laughs> uh, and if you looked at the science of 1960, biology was largely nowhere to be seen. Uh, there was a little bit of biology at MIT, but not very much. And in fact, most of biology was observational science. It wasn't, it didn't have a theoretical basis, except that the structure of DNA had been solved. And that actually was the event that generated the whole of the biotech uh, revolution. So there was nothing going on, except also that one person had come to MIT, Salvador Luria. And Luria understood the revolution that was about to happen and wanted to help it in every possible way. And if you ask me, that's the secret behind Kendall Square. It's that this one man invited students, invited young faculty, uh, saw changing foci of biology from molecules to cells to animals, uh, went with that flow and brought some of the greatest minds uh, of, of the time to MIT, to Kendall Square, where what they were doing exploded out of their laboratories into companies, into foundations, into uh, new ways of thinking, uh, and and from that was born the world that we see today. I would, I, I think, I agree totally with David there, but I, I think there's a deeper story that hasn't been told, and that is that the higher echelons at MIT, obviously, shortly after the discovery of DNA structure, as Dave mentioned, decided that biology was going to be mechanistic, gene-oriented, and molecular. And they invested in bringing Gobind Corona to the chemistry department and Salvador Luria to the biology department and a number of other very senior people. Uh, a visiting committee made the recognition that uh, the department uh, changed its orientation. And you see at Harvard, uh, Watson being recruited to Harvard. I think Paul Doty at Harvard was the force behind bringing Watson there. Um, so here on both ends of the red line in Kindle in Cambridge was uh, two very strong leading scientists, intellectuals. Uh, and then as David said, Luria was magnificent in bringing people to MIT and bringing people like David to MIT. And, and you. <laughs> and ultimately me. And Nancy. <laughs> and just a, a whole host of people who have had a, a 
a really amazing uh, impact on science. The other side of the story, I think, comes even uh, more historical. Um, there was uh, venture capital actually is thought, or is in some stories, uh, pictured as starting at, at Harvard and in the Boston area. So not only did we have in the mid 70s, a revolution in biological science, which was recombinant DNA genetic engineering, but we had as well a very active and knowledgeable venture capital community. And those two uh, components really stimulated the development of biotech uh, in the Boston area. Uh, in the case of Biogen, which was established in 1978, it's the third oldest biotech company. Uh, Genentech was the oldest and that was in 76. Uh, it was uh, venture capital out of uh, International Nickel and, and TA Associates with Kevin Landry and uh, brought a group of scientists together and, and with Wally Gilbert at Harvard and myself and, and ultimately developed uh, Biogen as highlighted in the story, uh, opening in Kendall Square, uh, getting a license to do recombinant DNA in Cambridge from uh, after the moratorium uh, was lifted, uh, the moratorium being uh, stimulated by uh, Mayor Bellucci. So uh, uh, this serendipity, uh, but a, a rich soil, both in the science side and in the, the capital side was, uh, I think, a, a very important part of biotech appearing in Kendall Square. You know, um, it really is an amazing story. And the fact that the um, regulation of gene engineering was the permissive act, instead of suppressing it, it actually allowed it to happen, I think is just fantastic. But as um, MIT got more and more involved in company founding and uh, the world of, let's just say commerce, I imagine there must have been some controversy or at least some ambivalence on, on campus. and. Um, Nancy, uh, you know, as, as a faculty member at the time, what was the view of the faculty of biologists who were formerly just professors um, playing a role in the marketplace? Well, that's a very interesting point, and it's hard to kind of imagine it now, but at the time, there really was quite a bit of controversy in the department. And I was very young, so I was just trying to stay out of the way of these controversies, you know. But um, I do remember there was quite heated debates about it. And I, I think um, there was this sense, you know, we just come out of this phenomenal scientific revolution started with DNA and the, the central dogma and so forth. The science was unbelievable. You know, you knew every couple of years, somebody you knew was gonna win a Nobel prize. It was just one monumental discovery after another. And there were people in the department who were very concerned that this phenomenal science might uh, be diluted in a way by being translational, that, that commercializing it could possibly impact the quality of the science that was going on. And I do remember particularly some of these arguments and a sense that we were superior, we were biologists, we didn't dirty our hands with commercializing the, the work, we were doing this great basic science. So that's this major uh, turn of events was to bring uh, commercializing um, translation of, these, of, of this science. And in fact, I think some of the young faculty were concerned about whether they should participate because they were afraid it might actually damage their careers. You know, that people might look down on them for doing that. But of course that was not what was gonna happen. And, and it sounds quaint today to think about it actually. You know, it's just, it's great to, you know, call that out because even today um, there is some, let's just say, um, uh, controversy remains, um, not so pronounced at MIT, but on other campuses about the appropriate role for faculty in the academy, in the academy or, or beyond. Now, Nubar, you were a graduate student of Danny Wong at this time. And so from where you sat, what did it look like? I mean, did you see a threat? Did you see opportunity? Did you ever imagine that your career would unfold the way it has? Uh, thank you, Susan. 
and, and thanks for having me as part of this discussion. Indeed, I was a graduate student and it, it was all kind of well beyond my comprehension what was going on. Uh, I, had, I came to MIT as an engineer to, to do a PhD in, at the time, what was becoming the beginnings of biochemical engineering. And, and it was one of the few places where one could go to do this, although it wasn't clear exactly what the discipline would be. It was kind of applied microbiologists and, and various other people who were beginning to, to lend a hand in trying to help people figure out how to process these novel biologic drugs. But what was clear was that all of our professors, Danny Wong, Charlie Cooney, certainly on the biology side, uh, you know, Harvey Lodish, many others, were also kind of involved in, in companies that were quite mysterious to a graduate student. You know, the media wasn't what it is today. You know, you'd hear about these things when they went public or when they, but it was just, you know, and then there were some graduate students or undergrads who had gone to work in these companies and that's how you related to them. And there was all of maybe six or 10 such companies if you really tried to look hard. Genzyme at the time was transforming itself from a reagent company into a, the beginnings of a, of a biotech company. Uh, so, so that was the atmosphere. And it wasn't clear how engineers would be able to play a role there. But given MIT's kind of engineering presence, there were many people who were trying to figure out what is the role of an engineer? How much biology do you need to know? Do you need to be bilingual? Do you need to be native? Those were those early, early days. And there weren't that many companies at the time. It's always hard to imagine when you go backwards, uh, you know, kind of what, if you're at, at a thousand or 5,000 companies, or I don't know how many there are now, going back to imagining 10 is, is, is very, very difficult. But at the time, 10 was overwhelming because it was highly kind of mysterious. And, and you know, Danny Wong, who sadly passed away very recently, um, was kind of this interesting pioneer of his own. We had forged into the space. He was helping Bajan at the time. And, and through him, we got exposure to what this breed of uh, company is all about. And in fact, quite by chance, I ended up um, in 1987, leaving MIT and starting a company at 24 years old, which was not what, not what young people did, not what uh, inexperienced people did, and certainly not what immigrants did back 30 some years ago, 35 years ago. But I don't think that would have been imaginable had it not been for MIT's kind of uh, at least experienced faculty who kind of knew what that space was. And then we were just beginning to take small steps to start actually creating companies of different kinds. In my case, it was a company that worked on tools as opposed to drugs in the first instance. So that, 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 was, the, that was the environment I remember. Wow. So Sangeeta, you're um, of a, uh, a different generation and does it look different today from the perspectives of MIT faculty and students? You know, what does Kendall look like uh, from the academic side of, uh, of the street? as you look across to uh, the companies that are burgeoning. Some of them are yours, of course. Yeah, I think, um, thanks for that, that question, Susan. I think, you know, in hearing in kind of the history, so I was a student in the 90s and then I joined the faculty in the, in the mid 2000s. And, you know, what really strikes me, I think the difference today is that faculty and students that come to MIT often are coming with the intention of integrating with the biotech ecosystem in Kendall Square. Um, we, you know, we are a draw. Uh, we select for those kinds of trainees, many of us. Um, and that's, it's not that no one, at, people come to MIT still to do fundamental research, but we definitely enrich uh, for trainees and faculty who know that they might want to contribute in this way in shepherding their work uh, to patients through a biotech interface. Um, and so actually Nubar's daughter, uh, Lena, is the, the co-president of, we have an MIT biotech group um, and some of the alumni might know about that. It was started just a few years ago. Um, and when the students started it, um, literally within a year, there were 500 members. You know, today there's 1500 members. So, you know, there's just an incredible thirst for applying math and science to human health problems um, that has, has built upon all this foundational work. Yeah, that's great. Um, and the students' enthusiasm for it is really just fantastic, stunning. So um, a, so we've got a question. Yeah, Phil? I, I just want to follow up on, yeah. on uh, Newbar's comment about Danny Wong, because uh, mm -hmm. 
he is a, or he was uh, a, well, he was a recognized pioneer, but, but when Biogen started, it was all a bunch of molecular biologists and we were trying to produce proteins and we needed to produce proteins at scale, which had never been done out of mammalian cells. They just had never been done. And engaging Danny out of engineering, who was a uh, engineer who was quite knowledgeable in microbial engineering, um, to bring that discipline to Biogen and then to other companies because he seeded with you know, trainees and he and Charlie Cooney, many other places, um, really made a, an enormous difference. So um, it was uh, um, really the first interface at MIT between molecular and cell biology and, and chemical production. I'll tell you a little story right after Biogen cloned Alpha and Apiar, and then this is Charles Weissman, and it's in the film. Uh, uh, we were licensed as a relationship to Shearing Plow, and we wanted to produce enough Alpha and to to treat uh, cancer. And Danny and Charles Weissman in a Eastern European uh, fermentation plant produced this interferon, purified the interferon, and was ready to ship it off to Shearing Plow. And Charles, in the tradition of scientists who are doctors who wouldn't give something to a patient they haven't given to themselves, the night before he was shipped it off, took a million units of interferon and injected it into his veins. Uh, he, he, he hit the floor. <laughs> and uh, so after a few days, uh, he was recovered. And, uh, but there was a note written to his postdoc saying, if you don't see me tomorrow morning, don't ship this stuff. <laughs> so it, it, it was a, it's an example of, of what the world was like back then. Yeah. But Danny Long made an enormous contribution to both the whole biotech world, as well as to MIT. Yeah, that's it's important to have that perspective because we often focus on the bio side of it. And clearly, you know, my passion for biology with engineering, uh, an early example of just how important that convergence is. So there's a question from the audience that I think fits right now. And I'm probably going to, I'll start with David, but others of you may have uh, something to add. And the question is, what was Robert Swanson's role in the birth of biotechnology and why given that he graduated from MIT, did he help start the industry in California? Uh, absolutely, he started the industry in California. Uh, he was working in a venture capital company, in fact, uh, when he was connected to, um, Phil, what's that guy's name? Herb Boyer. No, you mean Tom Perkins? No, uh, the, the biologist. Herb Boyer. Herb Boyer. Herb Boyer. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Thank you, Nancy. Uh, Herb Boyer said, felt like there was an opportunity to start a company, and he approached Swanson as a venture capitalist. But Swanson saw this as an opportunity for himself to be the CEO of what would be the first big biotech company and had the connections from uh, the, the mm -hmm. venture capital world to get actually large amounts of money to start Genentech. Um, and so he, he supported Boyer, uh, he supported other people in the uh, California area, uh, set up the first uh, research laboratories of Genentech and ultimately made some of the first products of biotechnology. Uh, he was a, a real visionary uh, and uh, died, uh, unfortunately, quite young, uh, having contributed enormously to the in, the in the founding of Genentech. But he still had many more things that he might have done uh, had, had he lived longer. I, I would add, um, 
Uh, a little story here too. Um, I got called in 77 by uh, Ray Schaefer, uh, who was a venture capitalist out of inter international NICO, uh, to fly to San Francisco to consult on an investment. And uh, I went out and walked into a room and there was Bob Swanson, Herb Boyer, Itacor, and Riggs. And they laid out the first technology that Genentech was going to use to produce first somatostatin, a little peptide that, that uh, as a demonstration that you produce a biologically active peptide out of bacteria. And then insulin A and B chain, and then growth hormone as, uh, um, uh, as the next product. I was hosted, we were hosted as a group. I was just a one day consultant. Uh, as a group with Tom Perkins at his house. Tom is an MIT guy. And uh, Kleiner and Perkins was one of the major successful venture capital firms on the West Coast. So here you had Tom Perkins and Kleiner and Perkins and you had Bob Swanson, that's a big MIT influence uh, with Herb Boyer who was a very entrepreneurial and fun-loving guy and a great scientist, is a great scientist. Um, and they did something really special as David described. I mean, they, they not only started the industry, they set the standard of the industry for you know, decades and still setting the standard through Genentech. So uh, it was tragic that we lost Bob Swanson, but he has left a legacy that has impact enormously. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Phil, for adding that. So, um, you know, we're all kind of celebrating this fabulous new facility in gene engineering, which held untold possibilities. But um, at the time, of course, and still today, those possibilities are for good and for ill. And um, I wonder, David, you were key in bringing about the Asilomar conference. So can you just share with us a little bit about how that came about and um, and in the context of this evening's conversation, did it have any impact on, on, on Kendall? Uh, yeah, it had an enormous, uh, in the end, positive influence on Kendall. Uh, but initially, uh, it was very negative because uh, the mayor of Cambridge uh, was worried by the new possibilities uh, this, this is now in around 1975, the new possibilities in, in biotechnology. Uh, and in particular, there was a sort of fantasy of a, a Frankenstein uh, being created in the laboratory and coming out of the laboratory and causing disease, causing um, uh, problems in the community. Uh, and this had been thought through in Washington uh, by people who were concerned. And, and uh, oh, wait a minute, let me go back a step. Uh, the, the first person to actually see this problem was Paul Berg, uh, who uh, ran a laboratory at Stanford University uh, where he was uh, proposing to bring together molecules of DNA uh, that had never been put together historically. Uh, one was a virus. Um, and uh, the people in his lab actually became nervous about this. Was it gonna do something unpredictable, un inappropriate, dangerous? And finally, Paul got worried enough uh, and Paul called me because we were friends and uh, I was at MIT then. Uh, and I said, well, why don't we have a meeting and talk about this with knowledgeable people? We did that in very short order um, and decided that it was necessary to have an international meeting to talk over what was dangerous, what wasn't dangerous, where were we in our thinking uh, as a community, uh, not just as individual scientists. Uh, and that meeting was held at Asilomar, California at a, at a conference center 
for a few days. Um, and it came out with a statement that we, there were unknowns uh, and we should go slowly, we should move carefully, but we shouldn't stop. We shouldn't uh, block the development of this enormously powerful technology because it was going to transform the world and, and it has. Um, and so when the mayor of Cambridge got worried about this, people said, well, we've already had this discussion. He said, you've had that discussion for, for Asilomar, not for Cambridge. Um, and so uh, he insisted that we go through a very careful analysis of what the dangers were and whether the, the leading figures in Washington who were putting together guidelines uh, were doing this in a way that preserved the safety of the community. And this group of people who, who made this decision, who were citizens of Cambridge with no particular knowledge of, of biology, they decided that the process was appropriate and that the, what was going on in Washington was going to provide safety for the community in Cambridge. And so ultimately the Cambridge City Council passed resolutions that provided a path forward. And it says in the movie, and it's certainly true, uh, that opened up for the biotech community, the opportunity to move with the new ideas, the new capabilities, uh, as long as you followed the rules. But that was a lot better than not knowing what rules to follow. Yeah, so I'm going to open this to anyone because um, this question has come from the audience. And so what are the chances to, you know, to bring this kind of uh, deliberate structuring and guideline guardrail setting uh, to the present? What are the chances that we might anticipate an Asilomar-like event uh, and impact around um, the similarly fraught issues of CRISPR? Phil, Nubar, Sangeeta, anyone? Phil, you're on mute. Uh, David has dealt uh, directly with this issue. Um, and uh, uh, I think the remarkable thing about the original Silomar is how cohesive the community was internationally in, rec in recognizing those uh, moratorium, the moratorium, and then working as an international community uh, to actually, you know, all adhere to the same process over periods of, of a couple of years to do these experiments. I, I think it's going to be difficult to find that type of cohesion now uh, in, in this, but David, I, th I think you might want to respond because I know you have experience here. Right, I, I've had the opportunity to run two international meetings considering the uh, uh, development of, of uh, CRISPR at Cas9. Um, and uh, at these two meetings, again, much as like at, at a Silomar, people came together voluntarily from all around the world and agreed to uh, follow uh, a reasonable set of, of principles, uh, even though there is no law that says they have to. Uh, whether this is going to hold um, or not is not clear, but there was one person who violated uh, these principles uh, and got lots of publicity for it but has ultimately become a pariah in the community. Um, and in fact is actually jailed, I think in China, uh, he's Chinese. Uh, and there hasn't been another case of this sort. Uh, so it may be that this uh, cohesion that Phil talked about uh, will hold uh, over the next few years uh, as we uh, develop a, a, a an understanding 
of what the CRISPR-Cas9 revolution is bringing us and how to control it so it doesn't do things that, that are inappropriate while it gives us the opportunity to do certain kinds of medicine that weren't possible before. You're, you're mute. Listen, you're you're mute. mute. There we go. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> so let's continue on thinking about um, the present. And uh, for Sangeeta, Phil, Nubar, whoever, what makes this area, what makes the Kindle area so fertile for starting companies? So what advantages does it offer to someone who's looking to start a company? What's magical about Kindle? Yeah, I, I can maybe start. I think. Um, everyone around the table has, has experience to share. I would say, um, you know, what's really magical in this moment is, is the co-localization and the density um, of, of talent in Cambridge. And so, you know, just to, I think we're storytelling tonight. So just to story tell, um, you know, in 2015, I, I started a company and, and the way that happened initially was, um, you know, a conversation with a mentor, Bob Langer, who's in the same building as I am. And uh, we were at an event with a venture capitalist named Terry McGuire, who's at Polaris. And uh, Bob leaned over to me at some point and said, why don't you tell Terry about your company? <laughs> and, so, and so I did. And he got excited. And you know, the next day I walked across the hall to Phil's office and said, Phil, is this a good idea? What do you think? Can you introduce me to somebody? And he did. Um, so that was the advice and the introductions to investors and then their trainees in the building. So postdocs who were willing to leave their positions and go start the company. And then there's the technology licensing office right across the street where you get the patents. And then there's the incubator space right up the street where you get the space. Um, and so that kind of density, I mean, you, you, know, you just start bumping into everything you need to make it happen in short order is, I think it's a real accelerator. Yeah, I, I, uh, Susan, I, I would say also that it, it's, uh, it's been interesting to observe it because once again, I think if you go backwards, it looks like this was always the case. But for as long as I remember, this was never the case. And then suddenly it was the case. And so it really had this kind of exponential, what people call hockey stick kind of phenomenon. Uh, even though all along the way, people thought we had some advantages, they were, they were kind of minuscule compared to what we have today. And, and not too long ago, I had to kind of talk about this topic at, at a meeting in Kendall Square. And uh, being from MIT, I kind of fixated on you know, some algorithm, which was that there's a lot of words with, with the, that start with the letter C that describe what it is we're benefiting from. Uh, first, I'd say there's, there's a level of courage in doing these kinds of first in the world things that, that I I exists here. And that it's hard to put a finger on where courage comes from, but certainly experience and examples help. So that's it, there's courage, there's creativity, there's confidence, there's community, there's capital, human and financial, and there's concentration, as Sangeeta said. And so it would be hard to imagine with all those things here, how it couldn't get an exponential advantage, but, but that those things were carefully assembled like a chemical reaction and mixed ever so, none of that actually happened. That in my experience, there, was, there were people who attracted people. There were a lot of experiments done that failed. Some succeeded, enough succeeded that it gained kind of a, a critical mass. And, and so yes, the. The financial world, I think Phil already pointed out, the whole service industry, I can tell you that, that the, the number of people in Boston, just lawyers who have represented 75 companies, uh, 100 companies versus two companies and then some hotels and some other kind of you know, movie theaters. I mean, this is, what, you know, this is what subcritical mass did in the early days. There was no biotech specialized you know, legal support, financial support. Recruiting, I mean, recruiting was a, was a complete, you know, kind of a, a mystery because, you know, there were like seven people you might ever talk to about leading a company. Now there's probably 700. So all of those things, I think, are there. And it is, it is a, a kind of a hard thing to prescribe. Certainly, I've, and I've said, Susan, you've, you know, we've had meetings before, that I think that this, you know, it, it, this happened around MIT for a reason. Some of the people, some of the 
the successes MIT had in the academic sphere. Certainly, you know, there was a reason why it's here, but I'd say MIT has a long way to go in, in, in taking its proper place in this ecosystem. Uh, and, and if I may just add that thought to the table, you know, being the big tree in this garden where every other life form exists, but not a big organizing, driving kind of uh, a life form, I think we can, we can uh, be much, much better integrated with, as MIT I'm saying now, integrated with the community as such that the, the mutualism between these companies and ourselves at MIT now uh, could be dramatically higher. So while MIT was the reason that this exists around MIT, I think MIT could play a much better uh, role, and, and I look forward to that. And that I know we're going to talk about the future, but I would comment that that I think that the, the, the good news for the next generation is we have a long way to go. <laughs> yes, yeah, so that kind of leads to um, a, a question, an obvious question, which is, you know, what is this mix? So there's the, you know, how do you fund biotech? The role of VCs and private investment. And, um, you know, how dependent are these companies on, on you know, particular um, capital structures? And, you know, on the, on the MIT side, you know, the, what's the role of our ILP and our TLO, the in, Industrial Liaison Program and our tech licensing office? So I think these are the kinds of things, Nubar, that you're, you know, referring to. Um, well, it clearly is an ecosystem. I think what you're suggesting is the various parts of the ecosystem um, are not optimally tuned. So Phil and you know, Nubar and uh, you know, anyone, just you know, talk, talk about um, how all that happens and um, what we've done well and where the gaps are. Where do they do it better? Um, I think what we do well in Kendall Square um, is that there's a lot of collaboration, interaction. It may not be formal. It may not be even talked about because people do it because it's mutually advantageous of, of sharing ideas. Uh, a young CEO uh, can easily get mentored by an older CEO in the community. It's almost a tradition to do so. Uh, the, uh, there's a lot of sharing of people that you know, start a company and once the company gets to the stage where its efforts are focused almost exclusively on clinical and, and uh, marketing, their interest is more fundamental and they, they move on to a second company. Uh, there's no question that, that the availability and sophistication of venture capital investing, not only venture, which is usually involved in the early rounds of funding a company, they now can fund collectively a group of them. It, it's typical to see a $50 million investment in, in what we call a series A and a, you know, a series B at 150 and a higher value. But then there's companies, uh, larger investors, usually private investors that are you know, managing money for retirement funds and universities and others uh, called hedge fund type things. And, and they invest. Fidelity is a major investor in biotech. I mean, the, you know, at the times, I don't know what they are now, but in, in times they own, 18% of Biogen. Uh, so it, 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 there's, a, there's a financial structure, there's sophistication, there's a, an, an amazing technical base, and you can recruit people from anywhere around the world to come to Boston. Uh, that, that's, uh, it, it's a community that has a great tradition uh, of people coming to it because it's seen as a university, technical, intellectual, art community, which really makes it a, a, a very attractive uh, place. Um, so all of that is working. Um, the, the great institutions that are associated with MIT, uh, the Whitehead Institute, the Broad Institute, both have major connectors to, to uh, 
the community and to MIT. And we haven't really talked about Boston's hospitals. I mean, uh, the whole Mass General Brigham and Women, Children, and Dana Farber. These are hospitals that are great research institutes and hospitals, and they're ranked one, two, and three or so in, in the country, as in the world, actually, as great hospitals. So that makes a community that is very rich in people, capital, people capital uh, tradition, uh, very sophisticated investing um, that uh, allows this community to, to really thrive here. And, we, and there's you know, new, new science coming every day. Um, and we, as Nubar says, we haven't seen is more lies in front of us than is present now. <laughs> and we can talk about that in a, in a while. Yeah, Susan, maybe I'll just add, since Phil did a good job of adding some of the missing components that make, that make Cambridge, Boston so advantaged. Uh, and I think that is the pharmaceutical companies. I mean, there's no doubt that there was a catalytic event that happened in, the, in some 20 years ago or whenever it was exactly, when Novartis moved their research labs here. And uh, being a member of this community, I know that that was an absolute step change because you know, American Home Products bought Genetics Institute. And so the other side of Cambridge started having some pharma presence, but literally never setting up a, a physical presence, which seemed to have caused many other companies to follow suit and put their, a, a big chunk of research here uh, of course, they came here in order to hire all the bright minds away from startups to have real jobs who were stable. Uh, after a few years, they realized that those jobs were as, as unstable as jobs in startups. And so now there's kind of a, an equal flow back and forth. But, you, you know, pharmaceutical companies had executives, had people who managed hundreds of people, thousands of people. We never had that in this community before. And Henry Tamir was, was kind of well known for having been a, you know, a superior manager. And then the next one behind that, you know, there wasn't that much talent. Now there is. So I'd say the pharmaceutical companies moving into this ecosystem and coexisting, by the way, they could have choked off this ecosystem just by buying up all the space and, and hiring all the people. That's not what they did. They really coexisted. So I'd say that was an important element of this as well. But, but we also haven't talked about space. So as I look kind of in the current situation, forget the future. There's no doubt that physical space is becoming a major, a major problem. Uh, I, I'll tell you, for example, you know, in real, real time this week, I had a meeting in our team and you know, you'd say it's a pandemic, surely some companies are failing, some companies are kind of moving out, et cetera, et cetera. And the reality is that I think as of this week, there's about a, 150,000 square feet of available space uh, in Cambridge against 1.6 million square feet of current demand. Current demand. That demand will not be met till 2023 based on new constructions. And that assumes no new demand. And so that's a disaster. Uh, and, and while yes, there's seaport and there's other areas that will kind of get the, the, the spillover effect, you know, I, I would say that, you know, basically Boston and its environment can all become a Kendall Square over time if this process continues, but, but that, that is a, currently there's just an incredible a squeeze and, 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 it, and I see that as a, you know, maybe that's good in some ways because it'll, it'll create competition and then that competition is good for, for excellence, but I also foresee some of the dynamics having to change a bit. Hopefully the concentration will not be lost, but, but it will certainly have to give way. Okay, Nubar, that is a re, oops, let me uh, um, that's a really important point, and I want to come back to it because I want to talk about um, the uh, constraints and the opportunities in the region. But um, Phil called out another piece of our opportunity, which is, you know, you characterize this whole biotech uh, mixture as one of mentoring and sharing and cooperation, which, you know, I, I don't know if it's uh, unique to the Kendall neighborhood, but it certainly is a critical part of, of our success. But um, I want to turn to uh, Nancy and Sangeeta to you know, address a question that you know, we've all been studying, which is how well is the biotech ecosystem doing in drawing on the region's full talent pool, both as entrepreneurs and as VCs? And um, how are we doing in calling on 
all of the willing and able people that are pouring out of our universities uh, in order to, to be sure that we are uh, exercising our regional advantage as profoundly as we can. Okay, well, shall I start off saying either? And Sounds good. good. Okay, and you take it up from there. Well, this is kind of an interesting thing, which I think was um, something that maybe we should have anticipated, but I think nobody really did. And that was um, that at the time the biotechnology industry was beginning, it was a time when women were just beginning really to enter onto the faculties of these great research universities. And so um, that in itself had taken a tremendous amount of effort just to get women onto the faculties. It took really the civil rights movement, the affirmative action, the women's movement, Title IX, all of this. And women were just uh, taking, getting a foothold in the university faculties when the biotechnology industry began. So in our department say they would have comprised about 15% of the faculty at the time that the, what David and Phil were talking about. And if you go back to that uh, era, so this was all a new thing to have women. Um, and the uh, women were increasing in number in the university under various societal pressures, but uh, the venture capital um, and uh, biotech industry was not experiencing those kinds of pressures. So um, for example, at the time the industry was starting, one of my colleagues who was getting involved in a biotech company said that he would like to ask me to join in founding this company, but he couldn't because businessmen wouldn't work with women. And this would have been typical of that era when the industry began. So this was nothing unusual. It was just the way it was. But uh, at the time it didn't matter. But the thing that's so interesting is that this um, exclusion of women from this industry of, of faculty persisted over the ensuing 40 years really. And uh, it came to my attention about oh, six or seven years ago when somebody from Harvard Business School came to see me and she said she had seen a list of people who had been funded by a venture capital company and think it might've been yours, Nubar. And there were a hundred names on this list and there was only one woman on the list. And she wanted to know how this was possible in a field in which, you know, 50% of the PhDs have gone to women for decades and you know, the majority of undergraduate majors have been women. So this was a peculiar thing, which I think nobody really noticed. And um, that is a tremendous problem because biology has been this field that had so many women. And so they somehow just didn't get to participate in this, this thing at this interface where faculty and uh, the outside world interface. And the result now is that this is fed back onto uh, students and postdocs who perceive this difference. And of course, that's a very serious problem for a university because it goes against the grain of what we do. So, you know, it was, uh, we've been very fortunate this year to get an opportunity to work on this problem. Thanks to you, Susan, and um, to Sangeeta. So, um, now we're trying to solve it rapidly because this has become such an important part now of the field that we fear that it's going to have serious negative consequences if it's not addressed. And it will cost the industry, of course, enormously not to tap into the talent of these amazing women uh, that are being trained at MIT. So Sangeeta, maybe you'd like to step Yeah, I, I think that's well said. I mean, I think we're talking about opportunities for the region. And I think this is an opportunity to do better and to do more and to pull in so many great minds that that in spite of the great progress really haven't been part of the conversation. Um, so, you know, we, we studied the, the number of companies coming out of MIT uh, in eight departments over the last few decades. And we found that women were starting under 10% of them. And if we course corrected, if we said they started per capita, the same number as their male colleagues, we found that there would have been 40 more companies in Kendall Square, you know, today. Um, and so, you know, that is the sort of the size of the opportunity, I think, that, that we're talking about. And so what we've started is something called the Future Founders Initiative. It has a bunch of work streams. Those of you who are interested, um, please, please reach out to, to me or Susan or Nancy. It has to do with putting women on boards, encouraging them to be um, co-founders, uh, getting them access to capital, only 2.7% of VC dollars go to women founded companies. So there's many ways to intervene now and, and hopefully do even more for the region in the future. Yeah, great.
So um, I, I want to get back to the uh, topic that Nubar raised, which is the issues of constraints. And I view with, as Sangeeta and Nancy have so beautifully said, one of our constraints is not, you know, providing opportunities for, you know, everyone who can play wonderfully in this community um, actually participating. And, and, and saying, saying you talked about the 40 um, not funded companies, but those are 40 undiscovered therapeutics, you know, 40 uh, medical devices that haven't been invented. So, you know, we actually feel that there's a, a lot of opportunity there. So Nubar talked about the space constraint in, Ken, it's constraint in Kendall, mm -hmm. um, whether there's a funding constraint or not probably has more to do with the state of the economy, but all the components are limiting. And frankly, when, resources are limiting, it drives price up. And so one of the questions that's come from the audience is, will the prices of Kendall real estate constrain our development, development of the whole region as a as the biotech central? And um, I would just kind of challenge um, the assumption that if it's not at Kendall, it's not part of the ecosystem. I remember um, while I was president of MIT, uh, Mayor Menino, who was uh, an enthusiast about the development of the seaport region. The seaport region was, you know, a total, just a wasteland, very much like Kendall was not so very long ago. And he was uh, focusing on the development. So he invited me over there in the building that became the Vertex building, wasn't even entirely closed in. And as we looked out across the seaport region, which he really wanted to develop into an innov another innovation district, he uh, made the observation um, that Silicon Valley isn't one place. It's a lot of different places connected by really terribly crowded highways. So transportation is really hard. And he said, why wouldn't the Boston region, the greater Boston region similarly have a number of nodes in this network of innovation industries? And obviously the seaport, Kendall, I mentioned Alewife in Austin before. And so I'd love to get your thoughts on first, uh, the real estate price becoming limiting, an incredibly limiting uh, factor in terms of Kendall's development and how you see the network, the possible network of innovation districts. And I don't know what the experience is in California, but um, it seems to me this is a, a topic on which probably everyone has a view. So let's hear it. Uh, let me try a perspective. Because uh, I come from California. I am in California. And uh, we've seen developments in San Diego, um, in San Francisco, the Bay Area, um, in Seattle, uh, and even elsewhere. Um, and everybody is struggling, except in San Francisco, in the Bay Area. And it's because the Bay Area has everything. It has all the things Phil talked about, the money, the uh, space, the uh, managerial talent, um, and it's all getting squeezed and it's all becoming more expensive. The whole story you've been telling about uh, Kendall Square is also relevant to San Francisco. And so it looks like a time when secondary places should have a tremendous opportunity to grow because they're less expensive um, and there's just less squeeze. And it's not happening. And it's not happening because I think that uh, the, uh, the future works on crowding. Uh, it's a bad thing from some points of view, but from some points of view, it produces the uh, connections between people, it allows for friendships, it does a whole range of things that uh, ultimately help the development of industry. Uh, so I wouldn't get too worried about what's happening in, in the Boston Cambridge area. Um, things are going to become more expensive. Uh, it is gonna be harder to find space but people are gonna still wanna be at the center of action. Uh, 
I'd like to hear a new bar, but I would say this. Um, it's already the case that many companies are moving or establishing themselves around different regions, not directly in Kendall Square. El Wife, out in Waltham, uh, down in the seaport, uh, in, in uh, a number of other places. Uh, and then, and then some directly starting in in Kendall. Uh, there's a different experience if you're in those different places. Uh, in some places it's easier to hire, some because it's easier to commute. Um, but uh, it, it, there are advantages, no question about it, of being in Kendall. You're visible. You, you, you get stimulated by the environment, by people walking by, the people you see in the restaurant. Now, all of this was pre-COVID. You know I mean, COVID has changed Kindle. <laughs> it has changed everything else. And, and how uh, we respond post-COVID or whatever that is going to be um, uh, will you know, take a while. But uh, there is a... There is a there, there are advantages to being in, in Kindle, but it is very expensive and, and even limiting as Dubar commented on the amount of demand and the amount of available space. And, and don't forget that MIT is in Kendall Square and the seminars at MIT, the people at MIT, the, the excitement around MIT uh, makes for the, the life of Kendall Square to be so rich. It yeah. doesn't hurt it, Dave. <laughs> it's clearly true. And I agree with it, but it's hard to, it's hard to say that <laughs> when you're saying Well, I can say it because I'm not there. <laughs> I, I would just say that uh, there's a couple of elements, unfortunately, uh, that, that, that happen. I, Phil is completely correct. We've had many companies of ours, including now, that are in Somerville, that are in Waltham, and and invariably, the decision to go out there is is a courageous one, and a and one based on economic considerations. And then the one, the decision to come back at any cost is a practical one, having to do with attracting people and retaining people. And and it is, you know, I I, I you know, there's a lot of data that we have that that really shows that while depending on the kind of company, um, there are some trade offs. The other thing is we're in a in a in a bit of a weird industry. Because unlike you know, companies that make products that are sold one or two years after they, they, they develop them early in a company's life and they are held to account for actually making a profit, um, a, a, an infinitesimal number of biotech companies ever make a profit. And so actually they're in the business of selling shares. And to the extent that there's demand for their shares, that is a lot of money getting into the space because of the value of the drugs that come out of that work. Basically, the question becomes, how much of a tax do you pay to the real estate person versus the other costs you have, which will shrink how much money you make. But if you're adequately rewarded, turns out you say, you know what? At the end of the day, if a company raises $150 million and if it's successful, it's sold for a billion dollars. So now you spent 50 million more on rent. As crazy as it sounds, that is kind of the, we're in the 10, 20, 50 times kind of amplification of value business, albeit with lots of failures. And so the failures aren't accountable for the, for the rent and the successes don't care much about the rent. I, I hate being very blunt like this, but that's kind of what's also a bit warping what is otherwise an economic set of considerations. And, and so what you do is you say, you know what, I'm going to fail more by not having the best people feeling the best about working there and having connections that will give them the kind of highest possible productivity, which is not just kind of a widget per hour, but it's kind of a bit, a bit uh, uh, hard to define in biotech. And, and that is always going to be more important than how much you're paying for rent. So I actually think that, and this is crazy to say, that where, when we moved into Kendall Square, we used to be out in Alewife, we used to pay $15 of, of rent 15 years ago per square foot. We moved to uh, right next to MIT at $35. Now any additional new space we get is between $100 and $120. And within five years, that'll be $200, $250.
no doubt. And, 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 and it's so, and by the way, the little companies who you would think would move out first don't want to move out because they need the critical mass more than the big companies. So the little companies want the big companies to move out to make room. The big companies can afford to stay and you get the dynamic you get. So it's just like, you know, it's like an ecosystem. It's going to be a constant battle and uh, it's not going to fit just economic considerations, I guess my point. Um, I actually want to call our historian in Joe, who uh, architected the movie. I'm just wondering whether in your uh, investigations, in your interviews, did you get a sense from anybody whether um, what has happened in Kendall is unique or whether, and whether it can happen someplace else? And what are the elements that we are, um, you know, that aren't present in Alewife or Waltham or the uh, dreamed of Austin? Did you get a sense from anybody about what was so special about our area that it's not going to be able to be produced? Or frankly, what, what's the recipe for reproducing it someplace else? Right. Yeah, that's definitely a question that um, that everyone on this panel and, and many more people um, uh, have considered and um, seems to come up over and over again with groups being brought to, to Cambridge and brought to Kendall to see it and people from Kendall being taken elsewhere to talk about it. And, um, you know, it, it, it always, what I hear, what I heard in the course of doing the film was, you know, it's not something that could be architected uh, elsewhere. Of course, elements could be, um, you know, replicated, but that it, it just, you know, it really was so, uh so complicated and such a confluence of so many unexpected uh things that it that it couldn't be replicated um i'm not sure what you know the rest of the folks on the panel would say but there were so many um so many factors that just seemed really kind of uh uh you couldn't replicate i mean the whole thing about the land the fact that land was available around mit which goes back to sort of urban renewal and the fact that NASA um, pulled out uh, from having the um, electronic research, uh, electronics research center there. And, you know, things that at the time seemed really, um, uh, you know, kind of like a, a big blow to, to Cambridge actually turned out to be a boon when it came to, to biotech, things that just couldn't be planned. So um, it always seemed to me everybody came back to sort of saying, no, you couldn't, you can't, you can't replicate it. You can, you can learn from it. Um, that's kind of what we hope people would do with the film too, or that the film would do was, was, you know, get this topic out there for other innovation ecosystems that, that have that question. But, um, but I'd be interested in hearing what this group thinks, because um, it always seemed to me everybody came back to saying, no, you couldn't replicate it, but yeah. One thing that I think that makes, um special, something that Nubar said earlier, he talked about his own history as an immigrant and I'm the daughter of- an You're, you're very light, Sangeeta. Get closer or more- Can you're, you hear me now? I, almost, you, you need to be louder. Hard to hear you, Sangeeta. I'm not happy, what happened to your mic? I don't know either, hello? Hmm, mm, okay. I, <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if any of our technologists can amplify you, um, but we can hear you, but we'll just be, be quite attentive. We'll be quiet when you speak. Maybe I'll scream, is that better? Oh, yes. <laughs> I was gonna say what is special, one thing that is special that Nubar alluded to is really um, the role of immigration and globalization in our town, in our region. Really, we are a draw for the best and the brightest minds around the world. Um, my, one of my favorite places to be on campus is outside the daycare center in Stata. Um, if you ever get out of the elevators there and you see people dropping their children off and you hear languages from around the world, it's so palpable. I mean, that really is something special about Cambridge that I think is hard to replicate at this density. Yeah, maybe I'll just throw, uh, just to amplify what Sangeeta said. Uh, I actually think, uh, Susan, that's a really good, good point in that I think MIT in which it doesn't get as much coverage, although obviously you and Rafael and others have made this point before, but I think it could be made a hundred times more forcefully. MIT, it, it has been a beacon for basically engineers, scientists, and all sorts of people all around the world to aspire to come to. I'll tell you on a personal level, I grew up in Beirut, Lebanon, 
and I left because of the Civil War. At 10 years old, I had heard of MIT. That's an outpost in the world. And I wanted to go to MIT. And I came to Montreal and I wanted to go to MIT. And, and whatever MIT did to cause that to happen, maybe it was the American University of Beirut or whatever, it exists everywhere in the world. And because of that, because it's been kind of open to people coming and just competing and working on, on a merit basis, which has been the, the credo as opposed to what family you were born in, et cetera, I think that has been an Im immense advantage for one particular reason. And that is, I think all innovation is, is intellectual immigration. That's all innovation is. And by the same fear of leaving your comfort zone and learning a new language and a new culture and being told you're looking weird, et cetera, those same things happen when you open up a new area. I'm sure that David and Phil felt like immigrants when they actually were doing things that they were not trained to do before they actually did them. And suddenly they were explorers. And so I think that MIT's welcoming nature, I remember very well that, you know, the, in, the, in, the, in the long corridor at, at MIT, in the first, when I just came in 1983, I remember there was a poster that one of the student groups or maybe the international office had put up. And it was basically an, a native Indian chief who had a finger pointed out saying, who are you calling foreigner, Pilgrim? And, and I used to walk by there every day and I used to feel at home because I used to realize that I didn't have to be born here. I didn't have to be American. I could be part of something new, the new, the new world. And I really mean this, not to be sentimental, but I, I really uh, feel like if we lose that, that's the other thing, more than expensive space, more than all these other things, if we lose that, uh, innovation, it's harder to do innovation than just to rest on your laurels. Yeah, I knew about you when, when uh, Tom and I were moving to MIT from Yale, a very close friend of ours, the uh, chair of the physics department, an Indian, um, almost with tears in his eyes when I told him that we were going to MIT, he said, you have to understand that for us, he went to the IIT, of course, before coming to the United States, you have to understand that um, that MIT dome it's like St. Peter's for us, uh, so the sense of, uh, you know, just a beacon. And, uh, you know, as I said, probably too many times, um, a beacon of inspiration for what science and technology can do to improve the world. And um, so the, the, you want, you know, someone asked a really interesting, um, many interesting questions from the audience that I've been incorporating in the questions that I've been giving. But um, one of the questions about this, um, other side of MIT, the Kendall side of MIT, does our efforts in tech transfer, in building companies, take away from MIT's ability to really you know, plumb the frontiers of basic discovery? So for all of you on the faculty, you know, anywhere, you know, is there a tension there? Um, or, um, you know, Phil, you, you for me are always kind of exhibit A that you can do fundamental discovery science and be involved in company generation for products that will save people's lives. But um, I do feel that tension on campus to some degree. And, you know, what do you all think of that? You know, are we somehow uh, missing our role as discoverers of the unknown by also thinking about how we turn these discoveries into life-saving products or just frankly, just cool inventions that uh, improve lives? Um, I don't think so, but it is always a balance. There's always a tension within um, the community about are you moving, what is the motivation in MIT? When you hire people, when you promote people, that's the big issues. You know, and when you invest in new, new projects, invest in new buildings, invest in new activities, and, then, and you always have this tension, particularly in life science, because there is a lot of unmet need in society and a lot of discovery to be done. And uh, I, I think that balance is, is important. I don't think you can do good science without having contact with challenges. Uh, but I think you can also be too involved and become motivated about money and raising money and, and how to deal things. Uh, so it's a good debate uh, and I hope it continues. Uh, and, but I also think it's, uh, 
it's a healthy debate. I think building bridges to engineering is is something over, over the last 10 years, you've been involved in it with a wonderful book on convergence, it not only empowers the discovery side, but it also empowers the translational process because the engineers can produce things and they know how to produce things and they know how to scale. So um, there's a lot of space there in life science, but uh, you know, there are frontiers in, in, in discovery science. Uh, you know, we know very little about the brain in a real chemical sense. Um, we haven't seen you know, the, the, the breakthroughs in I, uh, AI, like machine learning, translated into to basic biology as well as in, in translational biology. Um, so there, there's just a, an enormous uh, amount. And we got all this new data out of genomics and how to translate that and make, and make it a productive you know, uh, activity for society and medicine and learning about ourselves. It's, it's tremendous challenges. If I was a young person, I'd be, I'd be reading my textbooks in biology when I was six. <laughs> Not when I was, uh, as I did, as I got my PhD. So uh, I think it's, uh, there's enormous frontiers here in life science. And Nancy, you have a very long history in, you know, just in, you know, seeing the, this revolution in biology explode. And uh, it's a question we dealt with a little earlier, but um, do you see attention? Do you worry about our, a neglect of, fundamental discovery science in favor of, you know, sending our discoveries into the marketplace? I find this a really interesting question. I'm, I don't know who asked it, but I think it's a terrifically interesting question. And I was wondering about it today. I think partly I was thinking about this evening and I was thinking about this panel and I thought back to those early days and how amazing it really was to see, you know, every year and a half, like one of your friends won the Nobel Prize. I mean, it was just the way it was. And I sort of said, well, when were the last Nobel Prizes in our department? Because there used to be, you know, more Nobel Prize winners than women on the faculty. So I, I was saying, <laughs> you know, um, and has it, it's been a long gap, you know. So I guess that I think, you know, the science that's going on now in biology, the applied science, the translation is, is really thrilling. I mean, I, I really get it. I see why people are excited. I see why it's a magnet drawing people, but it is different. And there's no question it's different. And um, what, what is the impact? What do you wanna be? What sort of department do you wanna be? What, do you, what is your goal? And also I've thought about, um, you know, in terms of treating diseases, when people go in companies, the information is not spread in the same way among, you know, people as it is in the academic community. So it's just different. And I think it would take serious studies, I suppose, to really know the answer to the question but it definitely changed things. Yeah, it did. Susan, so, maybe I, Susan, yeah, I'm just go gonna ahead. add, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead, Nubar. Oh, I was just gonna add one minor observation because this issue has come up. I think there's something about the, 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 the terminology of basic research that keeps bringing us back to this because if you, if you look at how basic research is defined, which is that it's performed with no practical end in mind, and results in general knowledge and understanding of nature and laws, it kind of is a soothing feeling. On the other hand, as far as I know, pretty much all of basic research is both foundational to something that comes afterwards and enabling to something that somebody later on applies it to. And to the extent that it's basic research, we think one way, but if you think of it as foundational and enabling, it's perfectly fine, in my view, for some people to work on foundations without regard to what the application will be. But I think calling it basic almost gives it this kind of uh, separation from practicality. And I, I, don't, I don't know why that's an advantage. I think when, when we run out of foundations to build constructs around, we're gonna need more basics. And I think we all understand that. And I, we all, many people in the, in the industry side advocate for funding for what I call foundational enabling research, because to me, that's exactly the same thing as basic research. Thank I you. would also, can you guys hear me now? Yes, perfect. Yes. Oh, good. Okay. Um, I think that, uh, 
you know, Susan, you, you've written about convergence and this idea of um, invention really at the interface um, between disciplines. And I think the university has never had a more important role than it has today because it's, it's, it's unusual that you would have engineers and physicists and computer scientists and biologists and chemists sitting out there in a company um, you know, able to invent or pivot. Um, it really, the, the university is the cauldron where that happens, where you have those serendipitous moments where you get to try to do something and actually realize that you did something completely different. Um, and so I, I actually think, you know, more than ever, in spite of all of the investment in translation, that the, that the role for this, this convergent interaction in the university is, is, is more important than ever. Okay, so we are, um, uh, we can go on, but I think at nine o'clock people might want to change the channel, let's just say. So <laughs> we're going to do a lightning round and, um, you know, just forward looking, just quickly, if you can, what would you like to see Kendall Square become in 10 or 20 years? So let's just, you know, go around the uh, panel and uh, give us a few thoughts on where you hope we'll be in a decade or two. Anyone? I actually saw. I'll, I'll I'll line you up. Uh, Nancy, you're first on my screen. Ah, uh, well, I I think I'm going to give my time to Sangeeta so she gets two lightning minutes instead of instead of. <laughs> I, I'm going to leave this to the next generation. I have a very predictable answer, which is I would love to see more women and minorities um, in our ecosystem um, to just bring more talent and more medicines out there. Joe. Uh, this is the sequel to this film, so <laughs> I'm all ears. David? Uh, let me uh, argue with Newbar. Uh, I think there is something about basic research that separates it from use-inspired research, that separates it from being the underpinnings of, of development. One thing is time. Sometimes basic research generates knowledge which takes 20, 30 years to become useful. Um, sometimes it doesn't become useful at all. Um, and what I hoped for, and I don't know if, if it's possible, is that MIT doesn't get too taken with its ability to generate commerce and that it keeps a focus on basic research, um, particularly on the basic research done by young people because they bring new ideas, new convergences, new perspectives um, and are less concerned with the spinoffs and the, the utility. Um, if the world becomes so focused on making money, uh, it could actually dilute the effectiveness of the institutions. Um, and Nancy's comment that there hasn't been a Nobel Prize in a long time at, at MIT, which I hadn't thought about, um, is, is something to think about. Uh, Nobel Prize is God knows not the only uh, determinant of success, but um, yeah. is, is the uh, uh, desire of young people particularly to get involved in companies beginning to erode uh, the quality of, of pure research? Um, I'll take uh, a stab at this and I'll, I'll say two things. Um, in the uh, area of frontiers, one that I mentioned before, uh, I think there is a, an enormous um, fundamental, foundational, basic uh, discoveries and uh, advances to be made in integrating uh, the, the cutting edge of AI and, and machine learning into both 
fundamental science, basic science, as well as in the, to medicine. And I think that will drive with what is ongoing advances in our knowledge of life science across the board uh, into a, a, a new, a, a new understanding of it. Um, but the other part of it is, uh, I also think that in the more applied area, uh, we need to incorporate our ability to understand large data, patient response, identifying patients at risk, and find ways of translating medicine to be more effective uh, at a lower total cost. Um, that's the frontier we have to, we have to uh, surmount over the next 20 years. Uh, that's going to take changes in our national healthcare system. It's going to take changes in the way hospitals, insurance companies all integrate with one another. It's a very big applied problem. It's a very big fundamental economic issue. Uh, but the citizens of the country are going to demand it and we can't ignore it. <laughs> and uh, that uh, I think it's, it's another area that Kendall Square hopefully will lead in. Uh, and uh, uh, it would just be uh, a fabulous addition to the whole community. Nubar, you get the last word on this round. Yeah, I, I would say just looking into the future, um, but also commenting on what's been said, I think that it's a little bit of a simplistic view that, that, that industry is commercial and academia is pure. And that view has, has persisted despite the, the incredible morphing of these two areas, such that I would contend that there's more basic biology research being done in probably 30, 40 biotech companies than in all but a few universities in the world. Uh, on, and I mean it at the level of the science, the scientists, and I think they're all proud of what they do. Therefore, I don't think this distinction is as applicable in the future as it was in the past, because in the past, there were no entities who earned instead of received the capital needing to advance the frontiers. And I think what I find very, very exciting is the degree to which frontier work is attracting scientists, whether they're in academia or in industry alike, and their motivations are less different than what I, when I was a graduate student, is my observation. And therefore, I actually foresee, Susan, 20 years from now, that line being blurred even more. It may be very concerning to universities, but if we're surrounded at MIT by 20, 30, 40 institutions who professionally generate knowledge and apply that knowledge to have impact on the world's biggest problems, I don't think that's a bad thing of MIT. I don't think that's competition. In one case, it's a, it's a place where graduates can go, but I, that's what I foresee. I see a professionalization and an institutionalization of what is today a bit of a haphazard startup world that actually creates new forms of institutions that may not have education purely as a mission or research only as a mission, but it's much more of a continuum. That's how I foresee things but I can't prove that's real. Uh, but Nubar, what a great way to end because I'm, I am, you, you've been lecturing me on this <laughs> since I first came to MIT. And I have also come to see the incredible power in um, a greater convergence across all of these institutions and um, in terms of, you know, accelerating discovery. And it's, it's kind of, you know, in, in medicine, we talk about bench to bedside of bench. And I think that is the same kind of concept that we will be seeing in the Kendall Square of 10 or 20 years from now. So, um, and, and my other dream is more cross-disciplinary work. So when no one mentioned Akamai, one of our neighbors, and um, you know, and in my dream of the future 10 or 20 years out, there's gonna be an Akamai slash Biogen company of some sort uh, to, um, that will meet, you know, kind of Phil's ambition and dream that uh, we're gonna bring AI more intimately into the world of biology. So I want to um, thank all of our panelists. It's been a fabulous conversation and thank you for sharing your insights and your enthusiasm. And I also, on behalf of the Alumni Association, want to thank everyone for joining us. Um, and I want to thank MIT Video Productions. I want to thank the Alumni Association also for organizing this, but certainly MIT Video Productions. Um, and thank the, everyone for tuning into this special event. 
And um, I have to say, we really hope that you take away from tonight's conversation a renewed sense of pride in MIT and the ecosystem in which we work here. Um, in addition, an appreciation for the passion inventors and change makers and um, the whole Kendall story, which as we said at the outset is something that you, know, you, you almost couldn't event, invent. Um, it is a miraculous uh, coming together of a number of different factors to create change for the whole world. Um, we also hope that you will have a willingness to share the film with others to expand the audience. Um, the film itself is going to be available. In fact, this whole conversation, the broadcast will be available on the MIT Alumni Association YouTube channel within a week of today's airing. And um, thank you again to the panelists. Thank you to the audience uh, for participating in this um, really interesting conversation this evening. Thanks for joining us. And for more information on how to connect with the MIT Alumni Association, please visit our website.